This caused the passengers and employees in that terminal as well to flee in all directions. The increased panic and chaos set off a series of other false reports of additional shots being fired. What they didn't know, however, was that there weren't actually any additional shots. The shooter had been detained 90 minutes prior and wasn't even in the building anymore. This triggered countless hours of unnecessary lockdowns. Security footage from that day showed panicked customers knocking over signs, dropping luggage, and running through random doors looking for a way to escape. All passengers that were inside the airport were eventually evacuated, and another 10,000 passengers were taken to the nearby Port Everglades, which also became the Command and Reunification Center. This seemed to be the most logical place to set up the Reunification Center, as it was less than one mile away. It took several hours to secure buses to move all the stranded passengers. All incoming planes were rerouted to other locations, while some passengers waited on airplanes that were already on the tarmac for almost seven hours. The police and everybody's really trying to work on uh, securing um, the terminals. An additional 36 people were injured in the chaos while attempting to flee the airport, and five people would tragically lose their life that day. Many of the injuries included sprains, bruises, and broken bones. After Brandon was taken into custody, he was placed under arrest and taken to an interrogation room. He was willing to talk, and investigators wanted answers. Brandon confirmed to the police that he did go to the airport that day specifically to carry out the attack. The attack was not spontaneous, and had been methodically planned out down to the last detail. The only thing that was not planned out were his victims. Those were chosen at random. When asked, Brandon wasn't sure why he chose the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. He was exhibiting erratic logic, and a lot of his answers didn't make sense. Special Agent George Pirro, who was in charge of the FBI Miami field office, was the agent who interrogated Brandon. Special Agent Pirro is well known for his interrogation of Saddam Hussein, the former leader and dictator of Iraq. Agent Pirro was a seasoned interrogator, having months to question Hussein. In fact, he was Hussein's only interrogator, and was fluent in both Arabic and Assyrian. Agent Pirro had been an agent since 1999, and moved to California from Lebanon as a teenager. His first order of business was to determine if Brandon was mentally ill, or if he was faking. Meanwhile, many of the passengers spent all afternoon at the airport before they were allowed to leave. Some were there for many, many hours. They were complaining of fatigue and hunger, complaining that the restaurants weren't equipped to feed that many people. One man had a laptop in his backpack where a bullet had hit the backpack, and in turn ricocheted off the computer, saving his life. The man later found the spent shell casing in the side pocket of his backpack. A man called out, um, uh, uh, get down, that guy's got a gun, and we all, we all dropped. Ten feet away from me, I see a man get shot in the head. The shot hit near me, and I felt a thump on my back. As soon as we all stand up, we see who wasn't standing up. There's a hole in the side of it. And I'm like, that thump wasn't the luggage, it was a bullet. A young veteran who attempted to get mental health counseling, and after hearing voices in his head reportedly, um, was dismissed from psychiatric care after four days. That can we, in a nonpartisan way, use this moment to bolster... Um, whatever resources we need at whatever level and agree upon that more mental health coverage is better for society as a whole. There were over 20,000 pieces of luggage that were abandoned and held at the airport, some of which contained various medications the passengers required. But until the investigation was complete, the items could not be released. Airport officials hung large black curtains around the carousel to prevent the crime scene from becoming contaminated. Sadly, there were five people who lost their lives on January 6, 2017 at the hands of Brandon. The youngest of the victims was 56 years old, and the oldest was 84 years old. Most of the victims had just departed their planes and were on their way to enjoy a cruise through Panama. One of those people was Mary Louise Amzabel, who was 69 years old and was born on May 19, 1947. Mary was born in Ashtabula, Ohio, where she was also raised. She graduated from St. John's High School in 1966. On May 1, 1971, she married the love of her life, Edward Amzabel. They had two children together, who were now grown. In the year 1988, Ed and Mary decided to move to Dover, Delaware. 
Mary worked in the Smyrna School District for 20 years as a one-on-one special education teacher's aide. Everyone that was fortunate enough to know Mary would say that she was a loving wife, mother, sister, and grandmother. Family was absolutely everything to Mary. She could oftentimes be found sitting on her porch reading her Bible. It was a favorite important pastime where she studied her daily devotionals. Mary's loving husband Ed was also injured in the shooting and was in a coma for a short time. His life was forever shattered and changed that day without Mary. Michael Ohm was born on March 6, 1959, and was 56 years old at the time of the shooting. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, and graduated from Lewis Central High School in 1977. On January 31, 1986, he married his wife, Carrie. They had one daughter together, whom they named Andrea. Michael, or Mike as he liked to be called, was a licensed surveyor and co-owner and president of Boundary Line Surveys in Omaha, Nebraska. He was also a member of the Professional Surveyors Association of Nebraska, National Society of Professional Surveys, and Southeast Nebraska Land Surveyors. Mike also had one sister, two nieces, one nephew, and one great-nephew. He will be missed by all who loved him. The oldest of the victims, Olga Voltering, was 84 years young. She was a native of Suffolk, England, but had moved to the United States after meeting her husband, Ralph, in the Army. Ralph was stationed in England when the two met and subsequently fell in love. Together, Ralph and Olga welcomed three sons and one daughter into the world. They were also on their way to board a cruise ship to celebrate Ralph's 90th birthday. Olga had one sister and one brother, along with numerous grandchildren and even great-grandchildren. The two were married for an astounding 64 years before Olga was tragically taken from this world. Olga and Ralph were active members of the Catholic Church of the Transfiguration in Marietta, Georgia, for almost 40 years. They always sat in the front row each day for 5 p.m. Mass. Olga was joyful, loving, and caring. She would do anything that was asked of her, and was always more than willing to help others with a positive attitude. Others remember her calling everyone lovey or love in her unforgettable British accent. Olga never knew a stranger and was a blessing to all who knew her. Shirley Timmons was born on May 10, 1946, and was 70 years old when she was tragically shot and killed in the airport by Brandon. Shirley was from Senecaville, Ohio, which is located about 90 miles east of Columbus, Ohio. She is survived by her husband Steve and three daughters. Steve and Shirley met in the 8th grade and had been married for 51 years. While in high school, Shirley was a cheerleader and the homecoming queen. Some of her favorite pastimes were spending time with her eight grandchildren, going to football games, and all of the holiday traditions her family shared. Steve was critically injured in the attack after being shot in the head and had to undergo emergency surgery. Terry Andres was born on January 20, 1945 in Millville, New Jersey, and was 62 years old. In 1972, Terry graduated from Millville High School and at 19 years old, he decided to move to Virginia Beach, Virginia. He was married to his wife, Anne, and they had two children who were grown, plus three grandchildren. Terry and Anne were married for 40 years. Anne worked as a travel agent, and they loved to travel. Terry was known as a family man and loved to golf and play tennis. He would often be seen playing tennis at the Cape Henry Racquet Club in Virginia Beach. He was a family man and tried to spend as much time with his family as he could as he traveled a lot for work at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. Terry volunteered for the Oceana Volunteer Fire Department in Virginia Beach and volunteered there as a support technician since 2004. The Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport opened in 1953 with flights to Nassau, Bahamas. The airport is one of three airports that serve the Miami metropolitan area. There are over 700 daily flights to 135 domestic and international destinations every day, and it is the 18th busiest airport in the United States for passenger traffic. In 2019, over 36 million passengers were serviced. There were four terminals with 25 different airlines and four different cargo airlines. The Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport is one of few airports that charges a fee to private pilots. Fort Lauderdale was established March 27, 1922, and was named after Major William Lauderdale, who was the commander of the soldiers who built a series of forts during the Second Seminole War. The city is a major destination for yachting, 
and has over seven miles of beautiful beaches. The total area of Fort Lauderdale is just over 36 square miles. In addition to the beaches, Fort Lauderdale is known for its canals and waterways, and is home to the Fort Lauderdale Swap Shop, which is a large indoor-outdoor flea market. The world's largest drive-in movie theater is also located there, with a total of 13 movie screens. Brandon was born on March 16, 1990, making him 26 years old at the time of the shooting. He was born in New Jersey and had moved to Puerto Rico when he was two years old. Brandon lived most of his life in Penuelas, Puerto Rico, where he also attended high school. Though he wasn't born in Puerto Rico, he was still proud of his Puerto Rican upbringing and heritage. On December 14, 2007, he joined the Puerto Rico National Guard, and from April 23, 2010 to February 19, 2011, he served in the Iraq War as a combat engineer. After coming back from war, his family noticed a severe difference in Brandon's behavior. At first, they thought he was suffering from PTSD. He started becoming increasingly violent, and his anger was getting out of control. His aunt described Brandon as being disturbed by the violence he saw in Iraq. He described to her how he would see children and women being killed, and how he was having visions of these scenes that he saw while serving in Iraq. Not only did Brandon see extreme violence while in Iraq, he also saw a bomb explode near two of his friends who ultimately passed away from the explosion. After coming home from the military, he cut off almost all communication with his family. They just assumed his time at war had changed him, chalking up his drastically changed behaviors to wartime experiences. In 2012, Brandon moved to Alaska with his brother in hopes of a new start. From November 21, 2014 through August 2016, Brandon served in the Alaska Army National Guard and received a general discharge for unsatisfactory performance. While in the military, his highest rank was Private First Class, and he received 10 various awards while in the military. Yet, no one offered him mental health services. The Army just washed their hands of him, never looking into getting him a proper diagnosis for the erratic behavior that led to his unsatisfactory discharge. If they had, maybe things could have been different. While living in Alaska, his anger and violence only grew. In January of 2016, he was arrested for assaulting his girlfriend. According to the police report from the incident, he yelled at her, broke down a door, and assaulted her by choking her. When police arrived at the scene, the door was smashed off the frame. While out on bond, he violated his bond conditions. He was in violation because he was found back at his girlfriend's house after he was told that part of his bond was to stay away from her. He received a deferred prosecution which meant that he was ordered to serve a term of probation, and if he successfully completed his probation, the charge would be suppressed from his public record. In November 2016, Brandon went to the FBI office located in Anchorage, Alaska. While there, he said that the government was controlling his mind. Brandon also indicated that the government was forcing him to watch videos posted online by terrorists, and that he was being forced to join a terrorist group by the CIA. He was experiencing paranoid thoughts and grandiose lines of thinking. He was also hearing voices that were telling him to commit various acts of violence. Brandon was exhibiting classic signs of schizophrenia, yet until that time, he remained undiagnosed and unmedicated. It is nearly impossible in the U.S. to force someone to undergo mental health services. Authorities will only intervene when an individual exhibits signs that would indicate he intended to cause harm to himself or others. Brandon also stated that he had been in contact with different individuals on the dark web and that they were planning various attacks. After Brandon left the office, the FBI notified the local police who detained him and took him in for forced mental evaluation. Brandon was evaluated for four days and, shockingly, released from the hospital without medication or a follow-up plan. Afterwards, his electronics were inspected and no evidence was found that he had been on the dark web or had been watching any such videos. The agents at the FBI office stated that he was a walk-in complaint, which is something that happens every day. After that encounter, Brandon's handgun was taken from him by police. However, after 29 days, it was inexplicably returned to him without restrictions. In fact, it was returned in part because he had never been convicted of a serious crime, involuntarily committed to a mental institution, 
or found to be mentally defective by adjudication. When the local